Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. And welcome back to the podcast. This is part two of my review of fractures for the ABR core examination. Again, much of this episode will be done in a question-answer format where I will ask a question and have you think in your head what the answer may be, and then we'll discuss. I've had some feedback that this format was something that was effective on the first episode. I hope this is true, and I hope that this episode will also be helpful for many of you. So without further ado, let's get into it. Are avulsion fractures more common in adults or children? So one more time, avulsion fractures are more common in adults or in children? And the answer is in children. The reason why is that in adults, your bones are fully strengthened and they are typically stronger than tendons. So if you have an injury, you would tear the tendon first, but not the bone. However, in kids, the tendons may actually be stronger than the bones. And so if you have an injury, it is easy for the bone to avulse before you would tear the tendon. So children are much more prone to avulsion fractures. If you see an avulsion fracture of the lesser trochanter in an adult, this should make you think of what? Okay, I already told you that adults tend not to get avulsion fractures, so you see a radiograph that shows an avulsion fracture of the lesser trochanter. What should you consider? And the answer is a pathologic fracture, and you should think of this because adults don't normally get an avulsion fracture, and this site particularly is classic for a pathologic fracture. There may be an underlying lesion. Let's now play Name the Muscle Causing the Avulsion Fracture. So you have an avulsion fracture of the iliac crest. Name that muscle. And the answer is abdominal muscles. That is where they attach. So abdominal muscles, iliac crest avulsion fracture. And this type of fracture can be caused by a really strong contraction of the anterior abdominal wall muscles. And that causes the avulsion fracture of the iliac crest. What about a pubic symphysis avulsion fracture? And the answer is the adductor, ADD, adductor muscles. Those attached to the pubic symphysis, so avulsion fracture, pubic symphysis, adductor muscles. What about the anterior superior iliac spine? And the answer there is the sartorius, anterior inferior iliac spine. Answer there is rectus femoris. Okay, you absolutely need to know anterior superior iliac spine is the sartorius and anterior inferior iliac spine is the rectus femoris. What about the ischial tuberosity? And the answer there is the hamstrings. Okay, ischial tuberosity, hamstrings. Greater trochanter. And the answer is the gluteal muscles, okay, G from greater and G from gluteal, that's how I remember that one. Greater trochanter, gluteal muscles, and finally the lesser trochanter. And the answer here is the iliopsoas. Let's move on now to an imaging sign, and it is the Honda sign, and it is the H from Honda that gives you this sign, and it is a sign in the sacrum. So a Honda sign denotes which fracture? I'm guessing about all of you are going to get this, but if you don't, do not feel bad. That's why I'm reviewing it. Honda sign denotes with which fracture, and what I'm talking about here is kind of an H-shaped lucency over the sacrum on an anterior view, and that is a sacral insufficiency fracture. And I would know that there is increased risk of sacral insufficiency fractures after a patient has had pelvic radiation, or hip arthroplasty, or if a patient has severe bone mineral loss. Keep in mind that hip arthroplasty changes biomechanics and can predispose someone to a sacral insufficiency fracture. And the classic imaging appearance for that is the Honda sign. If you don't know what that looks like, please look it up. I should also specify that the Honda sign is related to bilateral sacral insufficiency fractures 
and that the Honda sign can also be seen on a bone scan. And the cause of this is that sacral insufficiency fractures will be vertical in orientation through the sacrum paralleling the sacroiliac joint. And then you also can have a transverse component, and that gives you the letter H in appearance. And perhaps this type of sign is most classic on a nuclear medicine bone scan, but I personally feel like you can also see that H appearance at times on radiographs or CT images, or I suppose by extension MRI with edema as well. But on a board exam, you would most likely be tested about the Honda sign on a bone scan, so look that up and be ready to get that correct. Next, what do we call an avulsion fracture of the lateral tibial plateau? And this is a really common question that is also very important that you know. So what is the name for a small avulsion fracture of the lateral tibial plateau? And the answer is a Sigand fracture. That's like second, but with a G, S-E-G-O-N-D. A Sigand fracture is a sign of what additional injury? And I think you definitely need to know that a Sigand fracture, which is a small avulsion fracture of the lateral tibial plateau, tells you that there is probably an ACL tear present, okay? So the additional injury with a Sigand fracture is an ACL tear. You expect that will be present in about 75% of patients with a Sigand fracture. And bonus points if you remember that this whole process is related to internal rotation at the knee. Now what is the twin called, which is a small avulsion fracture of the medial tibial plateau? And the answer, logically, is a reverse Sigand fracture. So similar to hill sacs and reverse hill sacs, there is also a Sigand and reverse Sigand fracture. The reverse Sigand fracture is a sign of what additional injury? With a reverse Sigand fracture, you would suspect a PCL tear. And this occurs with external rotation. So we really have opposites here. Sagan fracture, lateral tibial plateau, ACL, internal rotation. Reverse Sagan, medial tibial plateau, PCL, external rotation. Got it? Let's talk about tibial plateau fractures. Are tibial plateau fractures more common laterally or medially? The answer, and think about your experience on call to help you answer this, is that we more commonly see lateral tibial plateau fractures. And you should know some about the classification system for tibial plateau fractures. And what is that classification system name? And the answer is the Schatzker classification, S-C-H-A-T-Z-K-E-R. You should be able to know some of the differences between types 1 through type 6 Schatzker classification I think you should keep in mind that a type 2 Schatzker is the most common, and a type 2 tibial plateau fracture is a split fracture with a depressed lateral tibial plateau. Spend some time reviewing the Schatzker classification and make sure that you are ready for tibial plateau fractures when you get to the core exam test dates. So here's a random question. What is the most common long bone fracture? All right, out of all the long bones, what is the most common fracture? And the answer is a tibial shaft fracture. And that kind of makes sense to me because it's a smaller weight-bearing bone of the leg compared to the femur, and you just have a lot of weight on there. That's how I think of it. And our legs tend to get hit by a lot of stuff, or we fall and so forth. Tibial shaft fracture is most common. And let's now talk about some fractures of the distal tibial epiphysis. First, what do we call a Salter-Harris type 3 fracture through the anterolateral aspect of the distal tibial epiphysis? To remind you, a Salter-Harris type 3 fracture is a fracture where the fractured line passes along the growth plate and then down through the epiphysis. And Salter-Harris type 3 fractures have poorer prognosis because both the proliferative and reserve zones of the bone are interrupted. And I think the key between a type 2 and a type 3 is that a Salter-Harris type 2 will pass through the growth plate and then superiorly into the metaphysis, whereas a type 3 will pass through the growth plate and then inferiorly into the epiphysis. Getting back to our initial question, 
What do you call a Salter Harris type 3 fracture through the anterolateral aspect of the distal tibial epiphysis? And this is a Tillo fracture, T I L L A U X. You should know that the mechanism here is that the medial growth plate in the distal tibial epiphysis fuses first. And you will typically see this type of fracture in a teenager before the lateral growth plate is able to fuse. So you have some intrinsic weakness in the distal tibial epiphysis where the medial side is fused and strong, the lateral side is not yet fused, and this makes the lateral aspect prone to avulsion, and this is when you see the Salter-Harris type 3 fracture or Tillo fracture. Now what do you call a Salter-Harris type 4 fracture with a vertical component through the tibial epiphysis, a horizontal component through the physis, and an oblique component through the metaphysis. Okay, so I'm giving you multiple planes of the fracture here. Vertical through the epiphysis, horizontal through the physis, and oblique through the metaphysis. And this is a triplane fracture. Okay, there's three different planes of the fracture line. Triplane fracture. You should know this is a Salter-Harris type 4 fracture. And to quickly review, a Salter-Harris type 4 fracture has the fractured plane that passes through the metaphysis growth plate and down through the epiphysis. So it's going all the way through the bone. This has a poor prognosis. It is an intra-articular fracture. And in the distal tibia, you could get these three different fracture planes, which is key to identify that this is a triplane fracture. Make sure and look up those images if you're not understanding completely how this would look. So let's move on. What do you call an unstable fracture that involves the medial tibial malleolus? And with this fracture, you may have disruption of the distal tibiofibular synesmosis or deep deltoid ligament injury. But the key is an unstable fracture of the medial tibial malleolus. And the answer is a Massonov fracture. I do not speak French. I probably said that wrong. Sorry. Please forgive me, but it is M A I. S-O-N-N-E-U-V-E. Mass on maybe, fracture. I don't know. You can let me know if you know. And in this, you look on a radiograph of the ankle for a widened medial ankle mortise. And if you see this extremely widened medial ankle mortise, you have to think that a next step is to get radiographs of the proximal fibula. Okay, that is the key they want you to know, is that when you see the widened medial ankle mortise, your knee-jerk reaction is to get radiographs of the proximal fibula because that is where you will see a fracture of the proximal fibular shaft. So you need to know that a Massonou fracture is an unstable medial malleolar fracture with associated proximal fibular shaft fracture. Absolutely key for board examinations. This concludes part two of my review of fractures for the ABR core examination. I will conclude this with part three on the next episode. After the next episode is released, I will also have a study guide on fractures for the ABR core exam on my website, www.theradiologyreview.com. Finally, I wish to thank all my listeners again for your support and for joining with me to discuss and learn radiology. The Radiology Review podcast was very recently named as number two in a list of the top five radiology podcasts you must follow in 2020, according to Feedspot. And you can check that out by Googling top radiology podcasts or else find the link in the show notes for this episode. I want to thank Feedspot for this recognition. And again, check out that link in the show notes for this episode if you're interested. Lastly, we all recently received the news from the ABR that the core exam has now been delayed until 2021. I just want to encourage you to keep your heads up, despite the disappointment that this certainly is for many of you. I hope that my podcast episodes will be something you can listen to in coming months that will keep you motivated and interested to learn and will fit into your schedules and allow you to keep fresh on radiology board review topics. Remember to keep learning. You have to study really hard to pass radiology board examinations, but if you prepare, you will succeed. I'll catch you on the next episode. 
Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.